yeah, I, I'm Jackson. I have zero experience with carpentry. I studied at a school for historic preservation in Boston and learned about how things were built, you know, 250 years ago. There's a long way to go. I'm nowhere near the top. Not that I thought I was, but there's so much more to do out there. All right, welcome back to the Passion for Craft podcast. Uh, we are joined today by Steve Quillian, who is a master window restorer. And uh, Richard, you know Steve better than I, so I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce yeah. him. Yeah, so I found Steve on you. By the way, thanks for coming. I really appreciate yeah, it. He sure. came up from yeah. San Antonio. Um, yeah, I was looking, I saw Brent's 100 year window. I was like, hey, that pretty cool started working in some historical houses i'm like these windows are beautiful it would be an amazing thing to actually build one so what do i do well i'm a millennial so i go to youtube <laughs> and i say how to build a wood window steve has a ton of content on that so he pops up and i see him doing his thing building stuff but what i noticed about you is your your passion for what you do and in, in the state of craft but before we get into your opinion on that uh just a brief background on how you got into what you're into which is window restoration well it's really not so brief <laughs> <laughs> you know, so how do i explain really um because i started you know i grew up in san antonio texas as a uh you know just a regular kid and when it came time to start working with my hands I actually dropped out of high school and I went to work doing foundation repair, you know, crawling up under houses and things like that. And that was a, an experience having to dig the holes up underneath. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, breaking yourself against reality, you know, a young <laughs> high school kid, you know, yeah. crawling up under a house, trying to dig a hole. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it, it, it took a while to kind of figure that out, you know, but yeah. but from there, I ended up working as a carpenter helper with uh, a company that works in um, one of the higher end, um, uh, you know, play, you know uh, historic neighborhoods there. It's called Monta Vista, you know, Monta Vista and Almas Park and things like that. And I cut my teeth as a carpenter helper over there. And uh, I was always just really amazed at how these master carpenters that I was working with had the magic ability to like look at a wall and know where like the framing was and the studs. And they were always talking about bearing walls and, you know, and just all kinds of stuff. And I always wanted to know about framing. And so when that work um, dried up, I went and I found myself a, a job with a framing crew, framing, you know, big houses out in the uh, outskirts of San Antonio and stuff like that. And I learned how to, you know, build stairs, cut roof. And so, you know, I started getting a background in high end trim and now I'm understanding framing. And when uh, another opportunity uh, came up, uh, I got asked to be a carpenter over at George Strait's house and, and the Dominion. And he was building a big Adobe mansion out there. And that's where I really, really learned how to fly, you know, because I had learned, you know, about, you know, you know, plumb and level and square and all that kind of stuff. But in Adobe, you throw all that out the window and you have to do everything by eye and you have to learn how to use the hand tools and you have, everything has to be authentic. And, you know, after I did that, I got to do anything I wanted in, in mm -hmm. the carpentry realm. What happened after that? I, I did small jobs in, um, in, in the, in the wealthy parts of San Antonio. I think one of the one of the one of the things that was really cool about what I did is uh and I didn't realize I was doing this at the time. I didn't realize that I was kind of an anomaly, but I loved getting into the books and like I had this contractor ask me if he if I could make some timber framed trusses for this remodel he was doing. I was like I was sure. Let's, let's make some timber frame trusses. And so what I did is I always wanted to know about mortise and tenon joinery, and so here's yeah. my opportunity. And so I got the books on timber framing, and I read the books on timber framing, and out came these big timber frame trusses. That's cool. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was just really cool. And so all of that kind of changed when I decided to go into the ministry, and, um, you know, and, uh, and I, I, I kept all my tools, but the place where I had to go to school to be in the ministry was in Florida. And so then uh, I loaded up my truck and I drove to Florida and I went to school for four years and I got my degree in biblical studies. Nice. And um, I actually, after I graduated, I actually moved back to Watauga 
here, and I got a job preaching at the North Beach Church of Christ um, on North Beach. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, that worked out for a little bit, but eventually we ended up moving back to Florida because um, our dream was, you know, to live here and move here and all this kind of stuff and be involved in the ministry, but... You know, when my wife, who I met in college, didn't have a, you know, we we're going to transfer her school here. It didn't it didn't work out. She needed mm-hmm. a lot more time. And in Florida, you know, she could get a degree right away. Well, um, we just moved back to Florida and started over. I put my tool bag back on and I walked the streets to to uh, to find work. I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was starting from scratch 100 percent. That's kind of hard, actually. But eventually, I found I found enough work, and um, we're able to get this little historic house in a neighborhood called Seminole Heights. And Seminole Heights, I didn't think anything about the historic windows at mm-hmm. all. You know, we're you know right across the street. There's this old man. You know, when he passed away, we we picked up this house as an investment, and it had the old windows in it. So the first thing I do is start fixing up the windows yeah. and, you know, and, you know, and restoring all the doors. And, uh, I wanted everybody to know who I was. And so I hired an architect to, you know, we had some square footage onto the house and with my skills and framing and things like that, we just started, started doing it. And, and that's when I discovered that nobody was doing the windows. Everybody would come by and say, well, why don't you just replace them? I th- so well, what do you mean replace them? I mean, look at these things. They're, they're, they, they fit the house. They, they're they, beautiful. They're beautiful. They, they work. I mean, if all they need is some love, yeah. you know, and why would I take them out and, and replace them with, with, with what? Some stupid you know, thing that doesn't fit, <laughs> you know? And, Preach. You know? Yeah. And so, so, what, so what happened is, I mean, inevitably, you know, I need some replacement parts, like a sashes. It's uh, it's got termite damage or or some rot or something like that, and I didn't know how to make a sash, so I started searching for somebody to to make that. And there was ha- there was this old guy named Ernie on Florida Avenue, uh, a Cuban fellow had this uh, this shop. But what you had to do to get a window sash was you had to take the sash out of the opening, you know, take it to him. He would replicate it in his own time. Mm-hmm. And who knew how long <laughs> that was going to take? Yeah. Meanwhile, the windows boarded up. You know, I can't move on. Right. You know, and so I thought, this is a business opportunity. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to learn how to make sashes. You know, I made these timber frame, you know, trusses. Yeah. You know, and I, I want to really master the mortise and tenon. Mm-hmm. So here I go. And I went and I bought a shaper and I bought the tools, you know, and um, I had this little, this little itty bitty 600 square foot garage I'm working in. And, um, and I figured out how to make a window sash. And I ended up building, for the addition I put on this house across the street, I built all the windows. And, and you know, mortise and tenon and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was rough. Yeah. But, I mean, they passed inspection. The inspectors yeah. liked it. Everybody, <laughs> everybody was raving about it. And that house, when I sold it, sold for more, uh, more money per square foot than any house in the neighborhood had before that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really, really cool. And so I did a little bit of research, and I found out that in the Tampa Bay area alone, there were 80,000 buildings with 20 windows or more of historic buildings. Mm. It's 1.6 million windows. Wow. Right? 1.6 million windows. Okay. So that's when I started to get secretive. And I'm like, okay. And I started, <laughs> you know, you started looking over my shoulder right. at, Does anybody, did anybody hear that thought <laughs> yeah. that I just had? <laughs> You know, no one's figuring this out, right? If, if nobody's figured this out. If, if, you know, I better figure this out fast because if anybody f- hears about this gold mine, I'm <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking you know? about. Yeah. And so I was real secretive about it for a long time. You yeah. know? And so, but I made it my mission to understand and master everything I could about it. Right. You know? And you know, I was working on my systems, working on my style, uh-huh. you know. And, and eventually, you know, I, you know, this, this sash making thing, you know, this, the shaper never really worked out for me. You know, it was just too big and mm-hmm. heavy and it was powerful. But what I realized about the window sash is, I mean, it's got a molding profile on it. It's very small mm. and it's got a rabbit on it, you know, that's very small. Mm-hmm. 
you don't need a lot of power to do Just that. Just do a router, yeah. You know, and and I and I remember Grizzly. They had this this triple shaper. You know, it's like I had fantasized about having the triple shaper, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, if you can do a triple shaper. Why don't I just take this take three routers yeah. and attach it to the piece of plywood and do it that way? And so I did. That's the sash factory. That's, that, that's so how the sash factory. A little started. background on that. Uh, that's actually how I found you. Was I typed in how to make windows, and he's running these profiles on three different just routers, like typical routers, like any contractor would have, like uh, like. Two Are they custom knives on the routers? No, they're just a mono. Well, they didn't start bits. off that way. That's that's another story, but you know. Yeah, well, like the the thing that I copied from you because I stole his idea. I, he he was looking over his shoulder. But you I found was, the gold mine. I was like way late though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not doing restoration, but for me, it's just I'm you know dabbling in this stuff. But no, I am interested in it. So I was like, that's cool. He's got this sheet of plywood router, router, router like a basically an assembly line to make all the parts and pieces of a window sash and i was like that's really really cool so um that anyways that's background on the sash factory but go ahead no it's really cool the uh i mean the uh the sash factory you know you 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 asked if do i make custom bits and this yeah and the answer to that is yes okay but that really came a lot later after you, you, you know, there's a lot of things to figure out you know about if you're going to make a window sash, you got to make because I mean, there's there's no information out there. I mean, there is, but how do you get it? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's all it's all mysterious and almost esoteric now. Mm-hmm. To, I would agree with that. You know, I've tried to research you know. it. You've been a huge resource in that. Like, you just go out and type window stuff. Well, it's like, like so. Here, so here's here's what you find, right? If you go out and you say, "I want to make a window sash," what you find is this orange bit made by a company named CMT, right? The, you can you can get the same exact bit in silver made by Infinity. You can get the same exact bit made by Freud, but it's red. Mm-hmm. All right. And what's really strange about that bit, and I use this I use this for a long time, right. but I didn't know any better. You know, is that that bit set is it's so weird because you know in every you know archetypal piece of you know, paneling that's ever been made. Any any kind of door, you know, any kind of uh, any kind of frame and panel construction. The the artisans, the craftspeople, over time, they discover that the very the the, the very the very simplest, and most fast way to put something like that, to, like that together is to put the mortise and tenon right in the very center of the work, right? Okay, and this is this is like construction science that's emerged through trial and error over hundreds and thousands of years, right? Just thousands of years. You know that, okay, if we're going to make a mortise and tenon joint, let's make it as fast as possible, as efficient, because, you know, we got to go out, we got to make the planes, you know, to, to plane the wood. We've got to make the saws. we got to chop down the trees with our bare hands, yeah. you know. So we're not going to waste any time, any effort, mm-hmm. you know. So um, let's talk about... Uh, you know, I'd like that your background, you talk about a very varied background, right? You know, from digging holes under houses and leveling houses to working on historic houses to going doing high-end high end residential. I mean, your background to me reads to me as uh, kind of what is necessary to become a master craftsman today is exposure to a lot of different, you know, areas and things. Um but would you agree? I mean, that that's that's what makes you unique, um, in, is that you have tried and done so many different things. Yeah, and that's, I never really realized how true that was until I started trying to find people like myself. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it seems to be uh, somebody like me. They, I, I was very blessed with the education that I got. I didn't get it on purpose. Right. You know, it's just kind of it seemed to be the natural. Um, path that happened to me yeah well, I, to have, you definitely just had to go out and find it like even with those wooden trusses like how do i do this <laughs> let me go look at well, it well you know it's, it's weird because i think there's i think there's a um a, a confidence that i had I, you know i don't know where my confidence came from you know it's just like if somebody if somebody like i had this i was in monta vista one day and i 
and I was just doing side jobs. And there's one carpenter, because, you know, the carpenters and the painters, they used to kind of work yeah. together side by side to the painter to find, find something. Anyway, the window had some rod on it, and the carpenter asked me, he says, hey, can you fix this? Yeah, I never fixed a window before. Right. You know, and, you know, I, I have this, I guess, a belief in myself mm -hmm. that... I think that that belief and... Uh, confidence comes from working on old houses. I think that when you 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 see so much, and, and I base this on my career too, you see so much more variety. You have to problem solve in such different ways. You have to, uh, you know, meet so many different other criteria that you wouldn't if you were working on houses built in the last 20 years. I mean, you're working with wood, you're working with, you know, solid doors, you're working with, you know, double hung windows. Um, and so it's a question and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a statement that I think that confidence comes from working on houses. You described working with these guys who you were always amazed at how they looked at stuff and figured things out. That, I think that experience was probably invaluable. Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it's I'm a very kinetic person, and I can if I touch something and I hold it in my hand, it's like it's like the knowledge about that just transfers to me somehow. And so when I do, when I walk into it, like if I walk in, a, in an old house and I want to know how, how to trim out a window, mm -hmm. it, but this particular window is not trimmed out properly, maybe it has an aluminum in it or something like that. But obviously, the old frame is there. Well, I go next door. And I look at what would have been done. I look at the proportions, and I'm assuming that there's a reason why those proportions are the way they are, you know. And and I copy that, and that's it. And I, I, those these people become my teachers, you know. So when I when I walk into an old house, it doesn't matter where it is. I mean, I'm instantly absorbing as much as I as, as I can. You know, I don't, I don't know why that is about me, you know, that makes me different than other people. But like, if, if I want to know how to do something, I mean, I mean, I really research it and I, I really try to, you know, to be accurate about it, you know, and, and understand why they did it the way they did. I think that confidence is a, a big part of it. Like you said, you had confidence in yourself a little bit earlier. I've kind of been the exact opposite uh, where I've been like, man, that's crazy. Like I couldn't do that. Like I look at something and I'm like, whoa, like blown away by it. But what I've found over the past two years of really like kind of getting into more craftsmanship style stuff is that I am capable of it. I just need that confidence. You know, I wasn't born with that confidence. I don't feel like, so for me, I'm like, all right, look, man, like internally, you can do this. Like, you know how to measure, you know how to cut, you know how to, you know, you can copy, like you said, going next door. I've done that multiple times, like looking at the way things are supposed to be and then just executing it, you know, like that. I think the confidence is huge. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's why I, I was kind of making that statement about working on old houses. I think, um, you know, when we were working on depots and courthouses and, um, there was doorways that you would look at and if you hung the door level, it looked out of square because the rest of the building is moved and kind of things. <laughs> yeah. and, and so you have to trust your gut and you're trusting your eye and you're going, yeah, I know it's not level, but it looks, you know, it, th that actually it looks a lot look better. Like <laughs> and, and, uh, and then being able to hang a door square in an out of square opening, you, you learn skills that, you know, how to back bevel a door and how to do, do different things so that it'll work. And, 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 you know, it gives you confidence and it gives, and when you go into a new house and look around, you're like, this is easy, right? There's, there's no oh, challenge yeah, here. Yeah. Blindfolded. Yeah. Blindfolded. You know? Totally. Because you know? it's, 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 it's a 10th of the amount of challenge that that's, that happens in historic houses. Well, yeah, see that's, and that's what, you know, I think culturally it's, it's hard to find a carpenter, you know, because of that, you know, it's just because of the just the the the, the mass of uh, of just shoddy work there is, I mean, just materials and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just the staple it to the wall type of mentality. You know, when we go out and we ask culture to send us a carpenter, well, culturally they'll send us their carpenter, but that's not really a carpenter. Mm -hmm. You know, a carpenter is someone like you described. You know, where like you can. You know, you're, look, you're looking at that that opening, and you're going, hmm, 
No, it needs to go like that, right? And you'll throw the level away, you know, and, and, you, and, you, and trust in your eye and your judgment, you know, and on all the things that, you know, you kind of, you know, learn, you know, and maybe you get your little block plane out. Maybe you like shave a little bit off of that. So it kind of aligns with that, that jam that's not, no longer exactly straight, but it, you know, you kind of, if you just fudge it just a little, it lines up, you know, and that's just, you know, you can't find a carpenter like that. I mean, you can find somebody who will want to learn that, you know, and that's kind of my, my, my mission lately is to try to figure out what it is that I'm asking the culture to do. Cause I've, I've asked culture for carpenters and painters for a long time. And I've been, I've been shown a lot of things, but they're not carpenters, you know, and they're not, and they're not painters, you know, I mean, uh, to me, a carpenter is somebody that can, you know, that can, that can use a block plane, mm-hmm. you know, and knows where that fits mm-hmm. and what the dichotomy of the use of the hand tool versus the electric tool versus, you know, maybe a big table saw, you know, and things like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, a carpenter is really somebody that, that, that solves problems. And knows how to solve the knows how to solve the problems, you know, right? Doesn't is, just see a problem. And is interested to... in solving the problem, is intrigued by the problem. They ask the question, well, mm-hmm. why is it that way? Right. And oh, I got a question yeah. for yeah. you guys. It might get you fired up, but um, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, we all know there's big problems in new construction, right? But since you're a window expert, What's the biggest problem? And I want both of you to really speak to this, and you might have the same answer, but what's the biggest problem with the stuff you can buy from Home Depot? Like the windows, like the vinyl, like for someone who doesn't really know what the difference between historical and, you know, this yeah, kind for of someone art. like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the apprentice. Yeah, so, um, like so what's the just, big difference? Yeah. Well, if you want to know how to work on a historic home, you just have to stay out of Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, okay, really, because honestly, there is nothing there that will help you. Mm. Okay, they have, you know, they have a, um, they have like a thing that looks kind of like a doorstop. I think they call it a sanitary molding. And it's just wrong enough, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that you really can't use it on a historic house. Right. Right. You know, and... Um, all of their wood is so perfectly five and a half that you can tell when a house has been flipped by a Home Depot, um, you know, um, expert, expert, you know, it's because, you know, all the trim around the window has been ripped off of the walls. The plaster has been down. They think, okay, well, I got to trim it out again. Let me go to Home Depot and let me get a five and a half inch board. And they nail the five and a half inch board up and it just looks totally wrong. Everybody knows that it's four and a half, Mm -hmm. you know, if it's not four and a half and the edges aren't rounded a little bit then how can it be historic? But no, the flippers. You know, so if you want to know about, you know, craft, you know, you have to stay out of the store, mm-hmm. it, you know, at least long enough to actually see some craft and, and actually learn, you know, like, that's, what, that's what's so cool about windows, right? One thing, like, if, if you want to know about how to work on an old house, there's no better place of entry than in a window because you've got all the practical woodworking you've got all the practical painting skills that you need you know and if if you can master a window there's nothing really you can't tackle on 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 an old house i agree with that i i feel like window mastery is like one of the hardest things in carpentry like and then probably stairs is up there too yeah right it's it's like if if there's nothing like so so you want to reglaze your window what do you do Okay, you go to Home Depot because obviously that's where you go, right? That's and you, what I and you, and you for ask, a long time. <laughs> yeah, and you ask the person, "Hey, I need some glazing." And what do they tell you? Well, what's glazing? <laughs> okay, well, first, then you look around and you can find something that looks kind of like DAP thirty three, uh-huh. and you put, you know, and you go, you buy the DAP thirty three, and you start to glaze, and you discover that you can't really even paint it for a month, you know, and. So, okay, so they, they'll have something, but it's just wrong enough so that you can't really get into it. Mm-hmm. You see that? Yeah. All right? But, but what they do have is the Anderson window display, right? So if they don't have what you need, aren't you kind of forced to go and buy something else from them? Mm. Right? And then once you buy something else from them, now you've gotten your historic home in this cycle of need, 
You know, like if you're going to replace the windows, okay, now you have to replace them every 15 years. And who does that serve? It doesn't serve the historic home community. It doesn't serve the homeowner. What it does is it feeds the corporation because now you've got the house on a subscription model. Right, and so That's you're gonna. That's crazy. I didn't ever thought about it. And you're like gonna, that. and now you have to subscribe to the window gods, you know, <laughs> you know, at a cost of you know five hundred dollars a window or whatever it is, right? Every fifteen years. Well, okay, so, so a window is fifteen hundred bucks. Say it's two thousand. What, whatever it is, mm -hmm. okay, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Okay, but it's not more money than replacing your windows six times in a hundred years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and every single time you rip, rip out the, or, well, when you start, you rip out the original fabric, you weaken the fabric, you weaken the envelope of the house. Yeah, house yeah. And every single time you, re you replace it again, you see it all over. I mean, if you really want to start a slum, mm -hmm. you know, what you do, you start, re you start replacing the windows because that's when the houses start to really, you know, uh, tank in, in value, mm. you know, because after a while, I mean, all you're left with is the ability to, re all, all you can do is replace them with another piece of junk. Pivoting a little bit, you're, you, you know, we're in Tampa, and you're now back in San Antonio, and you mentioned something earlier that you've started hiring apprentices. Oh, yeah. And so that, to me, you know, is the is the magic word because it goes back to this whole guild system that we're trying to, you know, encourage as well. Tell us about the apprentice system that you're doing and kind of how you're re causing, you know, people to rethink the way we build. Well, first of all, it's not easy, you know, um, and, it's, and it's, it's something I'm, I'm really I'm still kind of exploring very, very diligently because it's it's not entirely obvious how you start and run and maintain an apprenticeship program in today's culture. Right. It's because the way the way people view work, you know, in jobs, you know, it's um, it, it, it 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 makes it it makes it complicated, you know, um, but what like what I'm trying to do is okay. So like so here so like here's the model, right? It starts and it started off with the city of San Antonio, right? Because the city of San Antonio, they're bringing me in to teach people how to restore windows. And so I've got a week long class that I teach, on and it's basic. It's the nuts and bolts, how you take it apart, how you put it back together so that it functions, how you do some basic stripping and refinishing, glazing, you know things like that we just barely scratched the surface but in a week okay i can teach somebody to basically restore a window and so that turned into the city of san antonio um taking these students of mine and then they would put them with um other trades people mm -hmm. they, they didn't have to be window people at all they could be you know a just general general construction type people. And you know, there are a couple of people that do windows in San Antonio. They happen to be my students, mm -hmm. you know, and they will, the city of San Antonio was paying them for 10 weeks to apprentice with these people. And I thought, you know what, if they're going to pay them to apprentice with these people that don't necessarily aren't really masters at the window, what would it, I wonder if they would pay them to apprentice with me? Mm. And so, sure enough, and I've been working the San Antonio angle for a long time, and it wasn't too hard for me to go out and get a project. And so, I started, you know, put it out there to get a project. Well, I got one. Okay, well, I've got one. And I said, San Antonio, can I have some apprentices? And they said, sure. And so, they, you know, they passed me over some apprentices, and we started doing this project. Mm -hmm. And and now I've got I've got some people trained. You know, it's it's really really the coolest thing. So anyway, so the the way the way it is right now is so right now it's set up. You take my class, mm -hmm. okay? It's a week long class, okay? And that qualifies you for a ten week apprenticeship, okay? Right now it's it's through the city, but I'm also trying to devise ways we can do it privately, mm -hmm. okay? So take my class. That proves that you're interested in what we're doing, and it's not just a job. Mm -hmm. If it's just a job, hey, McDonald's is hiring, whatever, mm -hmm. okay? But if I've got something I can teach you here that will, that will give you something that you can use the rest of your life. Like maybe you want an entry into the old house community. The windows are the perfect opportunity because you've got all of the practical woodworking skills you need and all of the painting skills that you need, you know? And so anyway, so... so 10 weeks paid 
you know, if, if, if you'll take my class, then you can apprentice with, with me for 10 weeks paid, mm. right? And learn the window restoration and sponsored by the city. It's sponsored by the city. It's great. You know what? But you know what? But the same is true. If you take my class, mm. I'll pay you to be my apprentice, you know, it's because in, in really what's, uh, and, and it's a, and it's a good trade because here you're getting something that you can, you can immediately go and you can start to make money. Right. From historic houses, and teaching what's, someone how to fish, right? You are, you know. I mean, you don't have to stay with me. And so, so the ten weeks is up. If they, you know, they have the choice at that point to stay with me mm-hmm. or go off on their own. So, do you? Pl- is there an apprentice salary, and then if they work out, there would be a regular salary, or do you just hire them? As hire them, even though they're apprentice. No, I, I, I if I understand the question correctly. You know, I'll, I'll hire them as an apprentice, as a paid apprentice. Is that what you mean? Well, I guess, I mean, as an apprentice, 10 bucks an hour, and then if they, if they work out after 10 weeks, you raise them to, you know, 15 bucks an hour or whatever the numbers are. Not that you need to tell us, just is there a price increase once they... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and that's, that's the way I have it structured. Because they're training, right? I mean, they're really still learning. Right, well, and here's, and here's the deal, right? So if, first of all, if you take my class, now you kind of know what, what we're doing. Okay, 10 weeks, you know, you're basically a helper, okay? Well, at the end of a year, all right, you know what's going on, you know, and we can put you on a project, you know, and now you can, you can service the client, you can service the company, you can service yourself, sure. you know, all these things. And, what's, and what, I, what I've really kind of grown to, the way I've really grown to understand it is that you've got this client base out there. I, I got a message on the way up here mm-hmm. from somebody in Dallas that said, I can't find anybody to do my windows. You know, I get them, you know, I'm based in Florida. I'm based in San Antonio. I'm not in Dallas, but it's, it's a problem everywhere. I've mm-hmm. got a student in, in, in Dallas I can refer him to. But see, what we have is we have this big client base, huge client base, residential, that's not being served. They need people. And well, guess what? I can be the person that connects the client base with actual interested people. Mm-hmm. Well, but I mean, you're, you're, I mean, talking about your, your, you know, problem earlier when you discovered in Tampa, you're like, Oh my gosh, you look at all this work. I hope no one's figured this out. Now you realize there's too much work. I need to be filling the market with people. Sounds like you've kind of or else Home Depot is going to come in right. and fill their and, windows. Right? I mean, is is that well, that's, a change? That's, 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 that's the irony of it all because you know, at first I'm like looking over my shoulder, I hope nobody <laughs> catches me doing this. And then like you, know, you get so far along you're like Dang, I wish I would have been telling more people about this all along <laughs> yeah, because exactly, it's, right? it's, it's hard to get the people that you need. Yeah, we're the same way. We taught free window workshops in these cities around the, around the state, um, just hoping that people would do it. And they would be, well, who can we talk to? And we were like, contractors, please come to this thing. Let us help you figure this out so that you can go do this. It's a great opportunity. Yeah, I do. I've, I've done so much, so much of that stuff. I used to do all the time a uh, class every first Friday of the month. Anybody could come, contractors, homeowners, yeah. and I would just give them the basics. Yeah. I would do that. I do week long, yeah. you know, seminars. Um, yeah. You know, I've I've had two week seminars. We've I've had people from all over the country doing you know restoration stuff. I mean, it's you know, it's, that, that, that's important, yeah. and that's you know, I I think that's where we are in the state of craft. Um, that you know, craftsmen have to be training others or, or we're in trouble, right? Uh, I mean, Lydia was talking about it in our last podcast that, you know, over the next five or 10 years, so many guys like me will be, you know, leaving the trade, you know, w- what's being left behind. And so, uh, you know, how do we train? And I think it has to be things like that. You know, I, it's, it's really important, you know, to, to, to find people who are interested and, and, kind of really in, infuse into them, you know, what it is they're actually holding and, and dealing with. I mean, it's, it's like the best it's ever been. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's like the culmination of all artisans, artistry and craftsmanship. Right. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's, if, if people could do the best, they were, I mean, that's what they did. I mean, they just, at the turn of the century, that's when they were doing it. I mean, it was, and, and you, I mean, you have to, and you have to think about why it happened too. I mean, everything was tipping. I mean, 
there was an endless supply of lumber seemingly you know um you know trains you know transportation was enabled you know quick just distribution of products you know the glass industry you know being really you know centered up north was able to ship in mass quantities now glass from all over you got this you know this lumber you've got tooling you know, it's just such a you know culmination of all you know such a perfect storm right you know and and people still had that that basic concept of hmm, perpetualism like i like to use where i'm going to make something i'm going to make it well i'm going to make it to last at that's still ingrained in their culture um and that's why i mean the, just that's why the things that we work on are so fantastic because it's like the greatest that we've ever done and ha huh, it just energizes me so much I, all i can I do tell. you know all, all i want to do is touch it right you know if, mm -hmm. I, if I can just touch it then i can understand you know and be educated by people who just knew so much more than me you know i i i, I, I there's so much i don't know you know that I don't, I don't think I could live enough lifetimes to learn it all, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's why I focus on the windows, because I had to focus on something, you know? So What does the next five years look like for you? Well, I, I hope it's the expansion uh, of the apprenticeship, you know, so that we can really, because it's not, ju it's not just me that needs it. I mean, it's, the, it's San Antonio has 33 historic districts, and every historic district there has a, has a lifetime's work uh, for, you know, for one, for one team. Right. It's true. You know, and it's true. It's true. Right. It's true. You know, like, okay, a properly tr uh, trained team of three people can legitimately restore a window a day. Okay? That's 260 windows a year. Right now we're doing a, uh, a house in King Williams in San Antonio that's got 22 windows. It's going to take us a month. Okay? I've got three people on it. All right? And, you know, that means there's 12 houses a year. You know? So if... You know, in King Williams, that's, that's a small house in King Williams. Yeah. 22 windows. I yeah, mean, it is. I mean, if you, 44, 88, you know, you could be on a house for three to six months easy. Mm -hmm. One team. And you're, you're doing some of the YouTube content you're doing is uh, to kind of expand that footprint so that you can share it with more people. True? Uh, 100%. Yeah. You know, because uh, cause if, cause if I don't, who will? You know, if I don't, it dies. Mm -hmm. And you know, somebody's going to pick it up and, and run with it and do good. It's, that's, that's why people sa have said to me, Steve, you know, you should patent your sash factory thing. No, <laughs> no. You know, it's not to me. It's not about that. You know, I mean, you, you've built something like that. My friend Jim in, in, in West Palm, he just built his own version of sash factory. I've got a guy up in Seattle. He's done the same thing. You know, um, I've got uh, my friend in Houston who consults with me all the time about why is not my, why is my sash factory not working mm -hmm. you know and and i'll you know <laughs> troubleshoot it with them oh yeah yeah you know because you have to yeah i mean what i mean what's the alternative no you know let them suffer <laughs> and let, and let the trade suffer yeah. you know and let, and let the because the clients have nobody they have nobody and if you're listening out there and you're wondering about what business you should start, <laughs> you know, well, there, the opportunity is in the millions. Well, of, and it's uh, funny to hear both of you guys say this because y'all are asking for direct competitors. <laughs> that is, it's that so, is weird. You know, it, but, but it just, I think it's a sign of showing like how much y'all care for the craft and you care, you know, for the quality that exists in our world that exists in, especially our country, um, where, you know, money tends to be the higher valued item. Well, I think than... we both see that we've driven around enough historic neighborhoods and seen the vinyl windows that have been placed in, in place of those things and how it destroys the architecture of the house. And we're just like, oh my gosh, they just, they're wasting money. They're throwing, you know, they're, they're, it's a stupid decision. It looks terrible. Or, it, you know, that too, I mean, drives me and makes me go, we got to get more people doing this. It's well, see, crazy. I, I, you mentioned the, the, the competition element of it you know there really is no competition right because i think what we're really trying to do is to bring back and revitalize this archetypal way of doing things right and i, I think if uh, somebody understands a historic window properly yeah you know okay then they're gonna do it proper and that's a win for everyone you know, and that's a win for everybody right you know and there's not i mean you know and what you know what am i gonna do i mean uh 
I mean, am I, am I going to feel in competition with Brent here? And am I going to feel in competition with you or what good does that do? Mm -hmm. It does absolutely no good right. for anybody to me. I mean, you know, that, that's why I'm here yeah. because we have, we have to, we have to get it out there. You know, that, I mean, this, this is a good life in the yeah. trades. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I mean, you can, you can make a good living. I, I, I this, Jeez. So, <laughs> no, you're right. You know? We have had an episode specifically talking about that because it is, it's a great living. It's a great opportunity. And, 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 a lot of and the don't. society tells people you should go to college, you could do this. And we're like, you know, there are other if, better if that's alternatives. Not for you, don't right, do it. Right. You know? well, I think one of, the, one of the things that you have to understand well, what makes you money in the trades mm -hmm. is it's skill and it's practice. Right. All right. You can't just jump in, you know, put the label carpenter on you go pick up a battery drill you know and expect <laughs> to be able to make a lot of money right it doesn't work that way right. you know you have to be able to hold your own right you have to be able to command the wood and the wood be obedient to you when you say be obedient right and that was the you conversation know? we were even having is you know the amount of time that you would spend at a college getting a degree or whatever if you spent that time in a craft where in college you're paying to be there and a craft you're not paying to be there, you're getting paid just less than you'd expect. Oh, man. By the end of those four years, you would have a lot more experience and hopefully be able to start commanding that wood and start to you know have control over the things that you want it to do and, and then be able to be paid a more reasonable salary and more, you know, but you can't expect it on the front end as you would. Well, I think, I think a person's compensation is, is, uh, is directly reflective of their actual competency. Right. And when a person is competent in a trade, mm -hmm. there's nothing they can't do. Totally. You know, there's, there's no place they're not wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad used to say, look, if you just show up when you say you're going to show up and you do what you're going to say you're going to do, you'll never be out of work. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, a, good, that's a good thing. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. You know, and if you can, if you can command your trade, mm -hmm. huh, <laughs> oh, man. you know what i'm saying i mean yeah. i mean yeah i mean what what couldn't you do i mean well said, i mean yeah. because you when, when an, listen when an actual artist and shows up on a job an actual i'm not talking about somebody you know that want that's a wannabe mm -hmm. but that person is the one that changes the whole atmosphere of the project yeah that's the person that everybody looks to for the knowledge for the experience for how to even think about this project mm -hmm. they're the hero and everyone elevates their craft to get on their level as well. Right. Well, yeah. and it says in Psalms, find a man talented in his craft and he will work before kings. Right. Yeah. So he won't you know, stand before obscure yeah. men. It's, yeah. it's just it's true. It's you you find someone that that's talented, uh, and they can command their own yeah. way. Yeah. So uh I know we were talking about this right before and we cut you off, but what uh what would you say you are in the we have this model here, apprentice knows nothing. I think we've established that you're not there. <laughs> Journeyman, you know, doing it day in, day out, and uh, still learning, still got a lot more to go. And then Master, maybe who's maybe on the other side, always still learning. But uh, where would you put yourself? Well, you know, it's, it's a very humbling question to, act, to, you know, to have to answer. Yeah. You know, because um, when I started, well, there was, there was a period of time when I didn't know who I was, mm -hmm. right? And... I felt like I probably should call myself a carpenter. Right. Right? Um, but it wasn't until maybe I felt like, like when I felt like I could hang a pair of French doors, an old French doors into a, uh, or a new, fr new French doors and old opening, maybe then I can call myself a carpenter. Is mm -hmm. that when? Okay. Maybe it's when I know how to cut stairs and I can, and I can you know, build a staircase you know, or something like that. Well, maybe I'm a carpenter then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe it's when I can work on a window. I don't know. Um, and... There came a point in time when I was like, I was getting some business cards made. This person was helping me do some design, and they erroneous. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you this. I switched from carpenter to craftsman when mm. I moved to Florida, mm. because when I was a when I was a carpenter in Florida, yeah. carpenter's different there, right? It's not carpenter as where I grew up, you know, in Monta Vista, right. in Almost Park, in Alamo Heights, and those types of things. Okay. Carpenters there, that's somebody that they'll call on to fix a toilet. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's like a, a handyman. Carpenter? Yeah. Wow. You know? And so, I mean, like a man, handyman, you said? Yeah, like a handyman. Wow. I and, associate that with wood. That's you know, so funny. So I was like, okay, so just <laughs> to distinguish myself, you know, I decided to call myself craftsman. Yeah. So that's, that's the basis of my 
my company name is Quillian Craftsman. Yeah. That's that's what I formerly am. Mm-hmm. DBA Wood Window Makeover. But it's Quillian Craftsman. Yeah. And so when I was getting business cards made up, um, the the person helped me. I felt it was erroneous. They put Master Craftsman mm-hmm. on the business card, and I thought, well, huh. <sighs> <laughs> I guess I'll keep it. Yeah. You know, I, guess, I, I, I guess I will. You yeah. know, as I don't know what makes a master craftsman, right? You know that way. Right. Um, but I think you know, as time has gone on, you know, I've um, I, I think I've learned that you know the master is a person who can command the work and also bring others along with him, yeah, or her. You know, mm-hmm. and who can have apprentices underneath you mm-hmm. and who that you're bringing along now. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think historically, you know, and Brent, you probably could tell me more about this, but I think a master, like a master builder was like the person who had people on, you know, that they would build a lot of things and they had a lot of people under their employ mm-hmm. as a master. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that that's, that's pretty accurate, but, um, and so a lot of people could technically be masters yeah. that way without being a master. Mm-hmm. But um, I've kind of I've kind of shifted my my um, uh, my focus away from being a, a master craftsman to just an artisan. Mm-hmm. You know, um, because um, I think I think. You know, in in our world, it's 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 complicated because the language gets diluted because you know everything is named craftsman, everything is an artisan beer. You know, yeah, you know yeah. what is you know what does that what does that really mean? Right. You know, totally. um, and I rather try to like let my work speak for itself and let people oh, decide yeah. what I am. Yeah. Rather than maybe give myself a title. Makes sense. Know? I like that. Um, yeah, I like so, that a lot. It's a good yeah. answer. Uh, I I I uh, that's I guess kind of how I feel about it. So. Yeah, I really like that. Well, Steve, we have uh, kind of a fun question uh, for you as kind of a, a wrapping up question. Um, and I, I'm really, really curious to hear what you have to say <laughs> about too. this. Um, because we've asked uh, a plumber, we've asked an architect, and we've asked a drywall specialist this question so far. And um, I think in all of those, there's kind of like a, oh, it's an obvious answer this. You are a woodworker and you uh, an artisan self-proclaimed. And so... Uh, the question is, if you're stranded on a desert island and you're tasked with building a house there, um, let's let's say your specialty, which is windows, you're tasked with building some special windows there. You've got all. Don't the frame it. Don't don't frame it too much. You're just on a desert island. <laughs> okay. What three tools do you take? It has to be you know what desert island. You know what kind of natural stuff? Yeah, do they don't have ask too. Don't that's, ask too many questions. That's, that's all I was going to frame for you. You have all well, materials there. Well, all you, all know, materials are set. Well, as you're as you're talking, I'm envisioning in my mind a hatchet. Okay. Right. Um, it's got to be a hatchet because you're going to have to build a hut. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, let's let's cut the let's cut the survival element out of it. <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to put out. This is survival. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah, what I'm talking it's, about. No, well, that's you know? why uh, I was trying to. He, this is his. Uh, what baby I'm going to do? I'm going to bring my fest tool. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring my. No, yeah, that's um, great. No, I don't. I I'm, guess three uh, favorite tools. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> well, okay, okay. Like you know, I don't. I don't actually use a hatchet. You know, right, but yeah. I think on a desert island, I would want a hatchet. If I had to bring another tool, it would probably be my block plane. Block plane. My block yeah, plane. Yeah. Um, That's on my list. You know, and maybe, you know, and now I think about it, a drill. A drill. You know, and, you know, with with maybe like a half inch bit or something like that, something that can make dowels and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, because cause you're always having a drill. And if I have a block plane, then I can whittle my, my dowels down <laughs> yeah. to about round and I can go into the hole and hold things together. Totally. So that's probably what I would do. And I can make a chair. It's a great answer. <laughs> It's a great answer. I like that. Because you've got to have a place to sit. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Well, Steve, uh, thanks so much for joining us on our podcast. We we want to shout you out. So if there's any uh, social media sites or places where people can find your work, um, we would love to give you the opportunity just to shout those out right now. Um, You just got to Google Steve Quillian or Wood Window Makeover, and you can find the Instagram, the Facebook, and the YouTube. YouTube is probably the most useful. Awesome. Um, Instagram has become like the the daily what up what, what am I up to kind of thing. Right. And Facebook's just kind of fizzled out Sweet, kind of yeah. thing. You know, but so you can, Steve I still Quillian, call stuff there Wood Window Makeover. Yeah, Wood Window Makeover. Wood Window Makeover. All right. Search him up. Uh 
Thank you guys for listening. Please go check out Steve and all of the work he's doing restoring windows uh, across America. So thanks for watching.